It is often said that General Douglas MacArthur didn't have a staff, he had a court. And while there were certainly a few courtiers on his staff, there were also some incredibly gifted men around him, men whose talents helped make MacArthur's vision for the war in the Pacific a success during World War II, and men whose talents might have made a big difference in the Korean War. General Walter Kruger was one of these men. Um, and he is today, I think, an enigma to a lot of people because he rarely appeared in communiques about the Pacific during the war, and he was seemingly uninterested in publicity or politics. And MacArthur himself compared him to Stonewall Jackson, but MacArthur biographer D. Clayton James compared him to George McClellan, two kind of very different men. Um, he's often referred to as steady, methodical, prudent, so much so that he was called molasses in January. And yet Douglas Southall Freeman considered him one of the greatest American soldiers in our history and capable of directing all the different pieces of a campaign. So who was Walter Kruger? How valuable was he to General MacArthur? And what was their working relationship like? And so today, I'm here with Jim Zobel, as always, um, and we're going to be talking about these questions. So to start off, Jim, um, an overview of Kruger's career begins. Had it not been for family tragedy, Walter Kruger might well have become a senior Wehrmacht commander during World War II. So that's a pretty fascinating statement, and it really underscores the fact that Kruger doesn't have your typical U.S. Army officer's background. So can you give us a, a, a brief biographical sketch of his life leading up to World War II? Okay, well, I agree. Yeah, we, we know very little about him. Um, I mean, he didn't keep a diary and he didn't have any memoirs. You know, the book he publishes is very official, almost like, as Holzimmer said, like after action reports. So there's it's hard to get at the heart of, you know, who Kruger was aside from his career. He's born there in Germany. Uh, like you said, his dad is, uh, was in the Franco-Prussian War, Julius Kruger. Um, but a couple of years after Kruger's born, his, his dad dies. And so the mom uh, decides she wants to go to America. She has family that's in America. Uh, she takes the children to the United States, um, you know, this is uh, late 1880s, because uh, Kruger's born in, in 1881, uh, and they go to, to Missouri in St. Louis, and she, her uh, uncle there is like a big brewer, you know, like a lot of Germans come over and, and start the breweries, but she meets this Methodist minister in St. Louis, and they get married, and then they live in Indiana, they live in Kentucky, they live in Ohio, and when Walter Kruger is getting to be about uh, 17, 18, he wants to go to the Naval Academy. That's what he, you know, was his desire, but his mom was so worried about him dying at sea that he didn't do that, and so he's going to this technical college in Cincinnati, and he's pretty much resolved that he's going to follow being a, a blacksmith, but that's when the Spanish-American War starts. And so he'll uh, enlist, you know, and that's the thing about Kruger. He becomes a full four-star general, but he doesn't go to West Point. He doesn't go to these military academies. He starts as an enlisted man. And so he'll be a, a, a private um, and uh, with the 2nd Division of Volunteers. He'll go down to Cuba pretty much after the fighting has started, but he'll become a sergeant. And then once the time is up, um, he'll get out of the army, but then the Philippines uh, starts, you know, the, the American called the Philippine Insurrection, the Philippine-American War, and so he enlists again in, in uh, I think, June of 1899, you know, the insurrection started there in about February, and so he'll go to the Philippines, and that's where he cuts his teeth there, and come about 1903, he's given the opportunity to uh, become an officer, and so he becomes a, a second lieutenant. And then after that, he'll go to Leavenworth, Army War College. Um, he's this voracious student of history. He reads nonstop. 
he very much gets into the theory of military doctrine. Um, and he'll go to all these service schools. He'll also have um, service with a uh, regimental command um, during the, the, the 1920s. He'll go to World War I. And, and the funny thing is he goes over to Europe and he's with the 26th Division right before they're about to uh, go into that um, Iron Marne offensive. But French officers get him out of there. You know, you're German. We don't want you here. And so Kruger gets sent back to the United States and they put him with this 84th Division, which he had been serving with prior to that. And immediately the 84th Division goes to Europe. And so Kruger will be over there again. So you got to think within a year's time, he takes the passage over, the passage back, the passage over, and then the passage back. Um, it's during that time he'll be, become very unenamored with the National Guard uh, forces. He believes that, you know, uh, you have to have these professional armies of, of 150,000 men um, with a, you know, strict officer corps. Um, after World War I, he'll uh, become this big, uh, not so much a theorist, but he has the ability to read all the confusing doctrine and then make it simple for everyone to understand. So he's really well thought of as this guy about army doctrine. He'll go to the Naval War College. Uh, he'll teach at the Naval War College. Uh, and then he'll he'll go to in the right before World War II in the in the 30s, he'll start getting he'll get promoted brigadier general, he'll get promoted to major general. And then he'll be working in the war plans division of uh, the War Department. And so he's got this wide ranging um, background of really understanding the army planning organization. He's been an enlisted man, so he knows what they have to go through. He'll be this guy who really looks after, you know, the troops under his command. And then in uh, 19, uh, late 1930s, he'll, he'll go and become a corps commander uh, with um, the third army down in Louisiana and then he'll eventually get command of third army and that's where they do all these Louisiana maneuvers in 1940 where they there's the first combined operations practice that they'll have he's planning running a lot of that in in that time he's able to put a lot of his theories to use because he's this big believer in combined arms you know during his doctrinal phase where he's theorizing he you know he had he would find things that he didn't really like and he would really rebel against them, but he would really push these things of, of inter-service cooperation, you know, these things he's going to be known well for in, in the Pacific and the doctrine of, of um, how you really work these battle plans, combined operations, combined arms, you know, heavier arms for the infantry using tanks, and but basically holding that solid principle that you fix an enemy and then you use maneuver to get around their flanks and, uh, and around their sides. And he'll, he'll, he's well thought of by everybody. Everybody, you know, knows who he is, um, but come to the time, you know, when he's finally chosen to uh, go out to Southwest Pacific, that's where he is, is in that, that third army position, um, believing probably that um, he'll just be training troops, you know, the, the whole war because come 1941 you know he's 60 years old you know he's he's a year younger than MacArthur has the same birthday as MacArthur and uh and and that's where that's where he thinks you know he'll probably be for the war is 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 training troops mostly just because of his age I think so you know um and uh, you know they you look to to younger commanders um, but it's really MacArthur that, you know, calls him to the fore and, and asks for Kruger specifically. Now, when MacArthur asks for him, though, he implies that they know each other really well. He implies that this is an officer that I have a lot of experience with and that I want to work with. Right. But do their careers intersect prior to World War II? Do they, do they really know each other? In that speech that one of those speeches Kruger gives at those birthday parties, you know, that we talked about, you know, in the 1950s, he's, he gets up and he says, I've known Douglas MacArthur for 50 years. And that puts it back to that 
turn of the century period in the Philippines. You know, do, you know, they're they're both young officers at that time. You know, did they did they know each other? I mean, Kruger's infantry, um, MacArthur's engineers, but you know, they both say that they knew each other at that time. They're at Leavenworth at the same time, 1908, 1909 time period. Of course, Kruger's going to school. MacArthur is with the 3rd Battalion of Engineers at Leavenworth, and then he's the commissary uh, um, commander. He's the quartermaster commander for Leavenworth. So he's like working more position. MacArthur will never go to staff college. You know, he's more working right. positions there. He's a demolitions instructor for the cavalry. So they're, they're both there at the same time. And then uh, in that time when uh, Kruger is working at the War Plans Division for the War Department, that's MacArthur's last year of uh, his time as Chief of Staff. So they're there at the same time. The thing is, because Kruger is such a, a, a theorist and a writer, and he's well known, um, MacArthur, I think, adheres to a lot of these uh, ideas that Kruger promotes. You know, he's, he's going to know who he is just for, for all of that, uh, because it kind of permeates the Army Kruger's, you know, thinking at, at the time. Um, and so we, we know that we, they know each other, but getting back to it again, you know, Kruger leaves no diary, leaves no memoirs. Um, you know, all MacArthur's correspondence before World War II is destroyed. So did they correspond before that? We don't really know. Um, but we just know they're they're at these places at the same time, and and MacArthur then says my long association with this man. So um, mm -hmm. they they both you know they both express that they know each other uh, very well. Okay. You know, but but we just we just don't know a lot. Now, so you've mentioned that Kruger spends the beginning of World War II basically training Third Army um, right. in. There's some difficulties in New Guinea in 1942, and by 1943, MacArthur is really looking to kind of reorganize his command, and that's when he asks for Kruger, but he also asks for the Third Army. Now, right, he's not right. going to get Third Army, that's going to go to Europe, but, um, you know, what, what does he expect Kruger to do for him in the Pacific, and what are Kruger's main responsibilities once he's out there? Well, it's interesting because when when MacArthur asks, you know, for Third Army, you know, he's he's saying, I, I I want Walter Kruger, you know, as well. I want, you know, I want Third Army and I want Kruger in, in charge of it. But they create a new command, the Sixth Army, and Kruger will have command. He takes a, you know, I've I've seen sources where they said he took his whole staff with him of, of okay. Third Army, but uh Hole Zimmer, uh, who wrote like the only biography of Kruger um, in about 2008, it's Kevin Holzimmer, who runs the Air University at Maxwell. Uh, he says that he, he took about half um, of the Third Army staff to, the, to Australia. And when they're on their way, one of the plane loads of, of staff officers crashes, all of them get killed you know, before they even get there. And the, the interesting thing though is, is before Kruger goes, uh, George C. Marshall is the chief of staff and you know, keeps tabs on all these generals. He calls Kruger in and he says, look, you have a hard time taking criticism. You need to uh, be able to open up and listen to people. You know, Because during those third army maneuvers when he was a corps commander, one of the other corps commanders had really blasted the maneuvers and blasted Kruger's uh, performance and Kruger you know, couldn't get over that. Um, but Marshall gives him that advice. And I think you know, Kruger took it to heart because you, in, no matter of all the things that go on in Southwest Pacific, which are really crazy. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it, when he gets there, it, it just, it's a madhouse. But uh, he doesn't take anything like that to heart. He doesn't get upset with people, you know, like, like Eichelberger will hate Kruger for the rest of his life and just, you know, wish he was dead and, you know, and MacArthur as well. And Kruger never gets upset about it. You know, everybody has a problem with, with Dick Sutherland. Um, MacArthur's chief of staff, um, you know, as well, you know, Eichelberger again, but, but Kruger really doesn't because I think he's just like, you know, you have no bearing on anything I'm doing and I just don't even have to consider you. <laughs> I think that's the way he looks at, at, at Eichelberger as well, you know, so the, it's, it's, you know, that, that part about the criticism, I think, you know, like I said, I think he takes it to heart. Um, 
When he comes to Australia, yes, MacArthur is looking for a force commander. The thing is, as Supreme, uh, well, as commander in chief of the South Pacific, he can't command certain forces. Uh, he has Australian Land Forces Commander Blamey. He controls all the forces. MacArthur tells him what to do, but you know, Blamey will have control because it's this inter-allied command. The thing is, MacArthur in his you know, contract or you know, uh, side of command, he can control task forces. And so when he brings Kruger out there, Kruger will control the Sixth Army, which is you know, pretty much you know, all the troops in First Corps as, as well, which is Eichelberger's you know, big deal. And, and that's why Eichelberger will be so mad at him because Eichelberger felt he deserved the Army command after what had happened at Bunagono. But when Kruger gets out there, MacArthur says, all right, we're going to create what we call Alamo Force. And so that will be task forces that then MacArthur can command without having to go through uh, Thomas Blaney, the Australian field marshal. And so it becomes this way that MacArthur can then control uh, the pace of operations using those task forces. And so when Kruger gets out there in about February of 1943, uh, South Pacific area and the South Pacific under Halsey are just about to embark on that cartwheel operation where Halsey will go up through the Solomon Islands and MacArthur will go up the coast of Papua New Guinea and they're aiming at uh, Rabao, the main Japanese base. So Kruger will be given control of this Alamo force. He'll operate on the islands off of New Guinea while uh, Blamey will take the Australians up and he'll run on New Guinea proper. <clears throat> Thing is, MacArthur is also going to give Kruger complete operational control. Now, MacArthur's staff, they, they create the strategic, you know, operations. This is the strategy one we want to use. Um, and MacArthur's uh, chief of staff, Sutherland, and his uh, G3 operations chief, uh, Stephen Chamberlain, who are both, are, you know, Chamberlain's top-notch guy. They'll give the strategic directives, but they're way for thin. You know, it's like we want to accomplish this. MacArthur will choose the forces. MacArthur will choose the commanders. But Kruger has control of all operational, you know, maneuvering of everything. He's the one that makes the plans for going into these places. He's the one that coordinates it with the naval and air components. General Kinney, who runs the Fifth Air Force, as well as uh, Admiral Barbie, who just got there, he'll run the amphibious, 7th Amphibious Corps, and then you'll have uh, Admiral Carpenter, and later you'll have Admiral Kincaid, they'll run the naval forces. He brings them all together, they create the plans for what they're going to do, and this is where Kruger really throws in this doctrine of cooperation. There has to be this cooperation um, attitude. The thing is, is they'll work it all out. You know, these different chiefs, they'll make everything come together. If they have any kind of discrepancy, you know, or somebody says, no, this isn't going to work, that's when they go to MacArthur. And then MacArthur will say, okay, we're going to do it this way, you know, and, and this is how we're going to make this thing work out for all of you. And so when Kruger gets there, they start on these operations. June, they go into Carolina Woodlark with the 158th and um, another uh, regimental combat team, the 112th Cavalry. They'll get themselves established. It's all about advancing the bomber line so they can control with land-based air power. So Kruger will work that. Once that's completed, then they'll go with Blaney into going to Ley and Salamawa and Blaney like Kruger. He'll work out that whole operation and you know have that be his idea. Um, and then they'll go into... Cape Gloucester of uh, New Britain trying to work up into that advancing on Rabaul the whole time, Halsey going up. So Kruger is really controlling all these operations and MacArthur is there uh, overseeing everything. Now you've got a, a, you know, you can say, oh, well, that just makes Kruger the main man. Well, yeah, it does, you know, in a, in a great many ways. And that's, that's why I say that it's Kruger that gets MacArthur and Kruger and Kenny, really, uh, the air chief, they get MacArthur to back to being that World War I guy, not behind a desk, but the guy who's out there, you know, making sure he's in on everything. And there'll be this uh, staff officer, Thomas Britton, who comes out there, and he had served in the War Department, he served in Europe, and he served in uh, the Pacific. And he said that, 
you know, even though Kruger's running all this stuff, MacArthur has full comprehension and full knowledge of everything going on. And that's what, a, you know, a lot of these people say, you know, is that the, the staff is doing one thing. You've got Kruger doing other things you've got. And MacArthur has all of it up here. And so it's it's this and that's the way it'll be. And that's the way Kruger and, and MacArthur will look at it for the rest of their lives. Like they had this symbiotic relationship. Now, it's it's a hard place to be in. There's no docks. There's no, uh, you know, in New Guinea. It's just all raw land. And Kruger had been planning his whole life to implement his doctrine in Europe. And all of a sudden you're in the Pacific, you know, Headquarters are never in one place. They're spread out by hundreds of miles. The only thing that connects everything is the ocean or airplanes. And MacArthur, when Kruger gets there, he knows he's going to be off looking at everybody. And he gives him, you know, his own B-17 to be able to move around and control all these operations and work all with all these people. And that's going to be, you know, when they make that first plan, Kiriwana Woodlark, that's the way it's going to be for the rest of the time of how they create all these operations. MacArthur's strategic study. Um, and then Kruger and, the, and those guys will put it together and they do it for all of New Guinea. They do it for Leyte and they do it for the Philippines. And uh, it's like MacArthur said, you know, he was magnanimous and modest in victory. And I have no idea what he was like in defeat because he was never defeated. You know, mm. now it's going to get, you know, it's going to get hairy because MacArthur's just going to push, 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 speed, speed, speed get this thing moving, you know, and that's why they say Kruger's like McClellan or Molasses, but I don't see him that way at all. I see him as being, I'm not going to get caught with my pants down. I'm going to make sure this thing works. You know, he may not speak up to MacArthur a lot uh, in that New Guinea phase, but Philippines, yeah, he's going to take it the way he wants to. And that's the thing, you know, MacArthur will, will push him and push him and push him, but he'll never order him what to do. And that's the way MacArthur is with Blamey as well. You know, he'll push him and push him. You know, well, you got to get this moving. But, you know, they'll, and MacArthur leaves him alone, you know, and, and, and never orders him what to do. So, you know, that when he comes there, MacArthur has a very specific idea of, of what he want, you know, wants from him. And, and Kruger will perform. Seems that MacArthur definitely trusts him more than he trusts a lot of the other commanders that he's working with. Um, I clearly, so. they mesh well in terms of, of personality. Um, can you describe Kruger's personality and his leadership style? Well, he, def he definitely believes in that, in that great captain theory that, you know, a whole army right. is, is, you know, comes from the top. It flows right. throughout everyone. And, you know, uh, aside from Michael Berger, uh, Kruger has the respect of everyone. Okay. You know, he's not a he's not a politician. He's not a game player. Uh, he doesn't suffer fools. You know, he's very uh, much a doctrinaire. He's very methodical about how he does things. But, you know, the, the but the thing is, is 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 Kruger really has a mind for the, that infantryman, that, you know, lowly guy. When he gets there in February of 43, he's got two divisions, 32nd, 41st, that are riddled with malaria. First Marine Division is there as well. And they're just, and the first thing he does is he gets all these facilities set up to get rid of that malaria, you know, to get everybody well, uh, supply problems. You know, the thing is, is, is when he gets there, I think there's like 185 ships sitting off Townsville because there's no docks and there's hardly anybody to move supplies. That's going to be the biggest problem, you know, throughout all these campaigns is having enough people, having enough supplies. And so Kruger will always be worried about, you know, the, the GI himself and, and how do we take care of, of, of them? You know, so he's a very, and that's what they said, you know, he had no, no use for anybody over the rank for corporal, you know, that's probably not true, but it's just, you know, they, they know he's a, he's a soldier, soldier. And so um, that working with MacArthur, uh, you know, keeping him happy, and then also looking, he's a, cons, he's a consummate performer. Uh, and, uh, and, and you, uh, like you and I you can't say enough about him. Yeah, I think I, I remember reading a, a story about him that he comes across at some point in, in I think it's somewhere during the New Guinea campaign 
a soldier who has really big feet um, and it's, you know, he, he doesn't fit in maybe your typical average regulation size boot. Um, and so he see, comes across this guy and he's like barefoot and he asks the guys, you know, commanding officer, like, well, why doesn't this guy have shoes? And the guy tells him, well, you know, he's this oversized foot and, you know, it's hard to get these supplies. And then like within days, there's a set of boots for this soldier, like in the middle of this war. So I think you're right. <laughs> There's always stories of him kind of coming in and being very concerned about the feet of his soldiers, their yeah. health, um, and stuff like that. So I mean, certainly, and he uh, wasn't behind a behind a desk. You know, he was no. constantly, constantly moving around, constantly inspecting everything, um, and and just you know, a a soldier, soldier. Now this is maybe a little unrelated, but I was just thinking. Um, obviously, he came to the United States as a as a very young boy but did he speak English with a bit of a German accent I don't know I don't know I've never heard that you know I, I know that Willoughby tried to affect you know having this this Prussian accent but it usually came off sounding like it was you know English rather, you know rather than than German but I don't think so because you know he's so young when he comes to the states right. you know that that um but he could still read it and still and still speak it because he used to, uh, you know, in those in those early days, he was translating a lot of German um, treatises, you know, on army and military and things like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, he does he does have that ability. Okay. All right. So walk us through his role in the liberation of the Philippines. Um, this is where he seems to be both um, aggressive and tentative at times, which drives MacArthur a little crazy. Um, how does this impact their working relationship? And is it true that MacArthur plays Kruger off against um, 8th Army Commander Eichelberg, Eichelberger um, as kind of a way to just make him move faster um, instead of ordering him to move faster? Well, that's the thing. It's, it's all about speed to MacArthur. MacArthur believes that you don't let the war go on for years and years. You try to end it as, as, as quickly as possible and the violence. And after that, uh, that new, new Britain, Cape Gloucester campaign in, in, in New Guinea, that's when MacArthur really starts, you know, putting on these guys, speed, 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 um, pulls off this Admiralty's invasion, you know, Kruger had been planning it, uh, and that's in February of 44, they had been planning it for April, you know, to use a whole division of the 1st Cavalry, MacArthur throws in all these, the uh, a reconnaissance force they have to co quickly you know redo the plans for this thing and then as soon as that's done macarthur's like we're going to hollandia so it's like you've got one operation still going while you're planning for the next one and then when you pass hollandia all of a sudden you've got like maybe four battles going at a time and you're planning for the next operation and kruger's guys are able to handle it you know and and they they are never have enough troops they never have enough supplies um they're constantly moving uh battle forces around you get into those periods at, at biak and wakti sarmi and, and and macarthur's still just saying speed 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 and you've got a uh, really uh, bad problems on Biak with the Japanese who are just dug in. They have to relieve commanders, you know, and, and uh, now Kruger is, is uh, MacArthur's finally gotten rid of that Alamo force and he's created these two armies in September to get ready to go to the Philippines, which is Kruger has 6th Army and, and 8th Army under Eichelberger. So yeah, like you said, now he's going to have these guys, you know, playing off each other and, and both of them admit it and everybody else seems to you know think this is you know say this is exactly what's going on which it was and the thing is is you look at macarthur's library there's everything about napoleon's marshal it you know who kept everybody divided kept everybody working to try and be the top guy you know to get them to go and when the thing about the philippines kruger again will plan everything you know all the planning for leyte all the planning for Luzon, which will follow that, you know, all the uh, combined arms operations again. And now on the Leyte, he's got an ability to have a big enough area to really put these, you know, hold them by the nose maneuver. He'll do these amphibious maneuvers to get behind the Japanese at Ormok, um, because the, when the, and that's really where the Japanese are crushed is on Leyte, because they throw five divisions in there that just 
get annihilated. But this is where Kruger is also moving at his own pace. Uh, he doesn't want to risk or waste troops. He wants, you know, all these guys to use these, you know, heavier weapons, artillery to be able to take all these places without massive casualties. But MacArthur will start playing him off against Eichelberger. And he'll tell Eichelberger, I might have to relieve Kruger. You know, I, I'm, uh, he's, he's not doing what I need. You know, he's, he might be beyond the time, you know, at, at this point. So, yes, he's using Kruger as a, you know, a way to get Eichelberger all geared up. November, they pull the 6th Army uh, away from uh, Leyte, throw in uh, Eichelberger's 8th Army because now they're going to go to Luzon. And that's where it really comes to the four world. Kruger, you know, because MacArthur there is all go to Manila, go to Manila. Kruger plans the whole thing going in. Yamashita has pulled his forces out to the mountains to the northeast. And Kruger is knowing he can't move without enough troops, without having, you know, this flank taken care of before they go to Manila. And so that's where it really seems MacArthur is really on his back the whole time. When they get to Manila, he'll throw in 8th Army to try and have this uh, drive between Kruger and Eichelberger to take Manila. But Kruger doesn't, you know, Eichelberger will be all geared up in it. But Kruger, again, no, nah, I'm, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> I'm going to do things the way I have to. You know, they don't even plan for a battle of, of Manila. You know, and that, that's one of the things that's kind of crazy. Kruger will think that MacArthur just wants to be in Manila for his birthday on January 26th, and he's not going to placate him with that. You know, but, you know, they talk about no plan for the Battle of Manila, and Kruger's uh, intelligence people were using those Philippine guerrillas at that point, like MacArthur was, and they thought everybody had to don't, don't tell almost they're, they're there. You know that the Japanese are there and going to hold on it as as much as they do. So yeah, when you get to Luzon, um, MacArthur will really start to play them off against each other. He'll send Eichelberger down on a sweep to liberate all the islands, and it takes troops away from Kruger, who's still got a major battle going on east of Manila, major battle up there uh, around Tarlac, major battle going up on in the mountain areas, and uh. He'll pull troops and give them to Eichelberger. And as somebody pointed out, this was right when Kruger gets on the cover of Time magazine. That picture that's right behind you. Yep. You know, does that have to do something with him, you know, looking so as askew at, you know, Kruger at that point? The thing is, is even though they take those troops away, Kruger is such a big a uh, proponent of these combined arms, he's able to use air power, artillery, um, to be able to go along with those troops that are still fighting up in, you know, the the mountain areas, and uh, and and still be able to handle it. And that, you know, that speaks volumes for them. And you know, people talk about, oh, he played them off against each other. He was saying Kruger didn't have it, but that's just MacArthur. That's the way you know he did things, and it's like. When he tried to get Kruger really to push to Manila um, and was, you know, advancing his headquarters ahead of Kruger, doing all these things to say, look, you know, nothing's wrong. Let's go to Manila. Um, when Kruger doesn't go for it, MacArthur's like, well, he didn't go for that. I'm going to have to think up something else, you know, to try right. and make him do what I need to do, you know. And so it's 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 not re really this anger at him. It's just like, oh, well, I guess I have to, you know, try and work him a different way but he never orders him how to do anything you know at all and when it comes time for promotions it's Kruger that gets that fourth star you know not Eichelberger and it's Kruger that MacArthur will say is better than Patton better than Bradley you know he's the best general of World War II and uh in the 50s he'll say why isn't this guy getting the credit he deserves you're giving it all to me, it's him that deserves it all. And so that's what I mean about this symbiotic relationship um, that, they, that they have. And even come 52 time period, um, when Taft is running, and a lot of people think MacArthur will get the dark horse, uh, General Wedemeyer is going around getting all these generals to back for Taft. And he goes to see Kruger. And Kruger's like, I'm a MacArthur man. Hmm. You know? And it's... They had that loyalty to each other. 
you know, and, and Kruger saw it for what it was. He's trying to egg me on to do what I need, but he's not ordering me to do it, you know. So it's just a lot different between the way he sees things, whereas, you know, Eichelberger just goes nuts, you know, with, with um, yeah. not, not getting what he believes he deserves. And, and, you know, he'll go to his grave just hating the both of them. Hmm. It always seems that Eichelberger desperately needs MacArthur's approval. I mean, he's very talented he, in his own right, but he just, he, he has this, you know, he just needs to be recognized by MacArthur and MacArthur knows that and seems to deliberately use that to manipulate him. In many ways. I think, you know, I, and, and it's like uh, Twelkowski wrote that book about Eichelberger and said, he wants to be MacArthur. You know, mm. In the press, ambitious, right. you know, in control, you know, and he just can't, you know, stomach the fact that, you know, there's somebody over him. And so he'll always say, you know, he ruined my career. But there was a lot of things that happened that, you know, MacArthur gave Eichelberg the chance to really show he was an army commander. And he didn't, you know, he, in MacArthur's mind, he didn't, he didn't come through. Now, you've mentioned the, the press. And um, earlier when we started, we talked about the fact that Kruger remains somewhat of an enigma to a lot of people because, you um, you know, he, he wasn't giving interviews. He, you know, the press was very interested in him. Um, but as we both know, publicity could be very hazardous in the Southwest Pacific area. If you're one of MacArthur's commanders, uh, you're not supposed to take the, the publicity or the, the headline away from MacArthur. Um, so how does Kruger handle this, especially as he becomes more successful and the press is really interested in who is this guy, what's happening here in the Philippines? How does he handle that in a way to not alienate MacArthur? Well, he just, he doesn't want it at all. You know, when a when press guy's around, he's like, get that, get that guy away from me. You know, don't be taking any pictures of me. I don't want any of that. You know, I, I you know, he, he's got to know that Eichelberger got sidelined, you know, after getting all that press coverage after, after Buna, Buna Gona. But then again, that's just Kruger. He's not this glory hound. He's not this, um, look at what I did. You know, he's this guy that is, you know, just army. You know, the, it's what's best for the army is what's best for me. And even, you know, after the, the war, when they, he gets the, you know, there's all these people wanting him to write his memoir. And he's like, I just, I couldn't do that. I couldn't sit there and go, oh man, look at the great things that I did. So when he, he writes that book, which is, you know, from Down Under to Nippon, it's, it's basically just after action report of the Sixth Army. I mean, he never mentions any personal ideas or thoughts or what he thinks of anybody or, or anything. I mean, it, it's a, I like it because it really explains everything, but it's a boring book, you know, because it's, this happened, this happened, these units, you know, this operation, you know, there's, there's nothing, you know, at all going on. And, and we know a lot, of, a lot of things of, of how he, you know, he did think of certain personalities and whatnot, just because of, you know, other things we've done. But I, I, I think he just, he doesn't want it and he doesn't seek it. Hmm. Which probably helps him mesh well with MacArthur. He's no kind of publicity <laughs> threat. Okay, so, all right, so we've gotten through the Philippines at this point. What is Kruger's role in the Pacific after the Philippines and through the end of the war? Well, he plans the entire invasion of Japan. You know, I mean, he's about to command the biggest operation in military history ever. Um, putting those plans for the invasion of, of Kyushu and, um, and Honshu. And he'll work with the Navy once again. This time it's going to be, you know, complete uh, Central Pacific forces, Pacific, you know, forces under Nimitz, um, working, you know, completely with all of the troops under MacArthur and the United States Army Force Pacific. And it, it's uh, about, I guess, June of... of Forty-five is when MacArthur declares the campaign on, on Luzon is over, and that's when 
then Kruger is just completely into planning. Of course, the war ends come August. It's not going to have to go off. Kruger thinks it's strategic bombing that destroys Japan. He doesn't think it's the bombs. Uh, he thinks that 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 was just a great opportunity that the Japanese could then surrender by saving face. You know, we face something that's mystical and all powerful rather than something that's, you know, conventional um, weaponry or, or whatnot. He'll go into Japan as the sixth army commander for the occupation. He'll set up in, in Kyoto, Japan. Again, he's flying everywhere because, you know, the forces are all there. Um, um, throughout and he'll be, you know, nonstop everywhere, but he's only there for about six months because, or three months, because come December, Sixth Army's inactivated and those guys are going to go home. Eichelberger and Eighth Army will take over in uh, Japan. And so come December, they have the inactivation and he'll stay there for another month, making sure everybody gets out, you know, all the, you know, accreditation for everybody is, is ship shape. And, uh, then he'll, uh, January, end of January, he'll take a trans or take up, I think he goes home on the New Jersey, like the bat, one of the, you know, yeah. big battleships takes him back home. And, uh, and that, you know, that last picture that we have that they both signed with MacArthur and he in, in the um, office at the Daiichi building, you know, and MacArthur's, you know, make sure that, you know, in the picture, he's got his arm around Kruger. You know, and that's the way MacArthur did it. You know, we're, this is going to show how close we are. This is going to show everyone, you know, of, of, of what it is. And so then he'll go home and be retired, you know, and have the same problem everybody else does. You know, I've been in the military home my, my whole life, and now I'm, you know, out of all that activity. I find his final years kind of tragic. Yeah, yeah, very much so. You know, he comes home, his wife is very sick. He you know, he wants to be a part of, of creating that army doctrine for the nuclear age. He wants to ensure that, uh, you know, he's, he's uh, agrees with the amalgamation of the Defense Department, believes that, you know, coordination between the services is the most important part of the military. Um, he's asked to speak everywhere uh, and to do these things, but he has no staff now. You know, he can't type, um, and it's just, he finds it to be very, you know, hard and very, very limiting for him. And then, yeah, like you said, he, he has a lot of tragedies with his son, with his daughter, um, and then his wife will die in about, you know, 50, 55 or so. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts on MacArthur and Kruger? It's hard to see him have such tragedy, you know, after all, all of that, you know, to finally come home and, and go to that. You know, he'll, he takes great, I think, relaxation in going to those Southwest Pacific dinner parties, um, you know, the birthday parties for MacArthur. The last one he goes to, I think, in 63, because he comes real frail. Uh, he has a lot of back problems and he has to walk with a cane. But he'll go to that party and he and MacArthur cut the cake together. You know, it's their birthday together. Um, in 64, when MacArthur dies, he's here at the memorial. He comes to the funeral, you know, in bad health, in, in a very, you know, rickety ability to even stand. And he's here for it. And, you know, then a few years, few years later, he, he'll, he'll die in 1967. And he's, he is, he's, he's, it's like uh, Holzimer said, the unsung hero of the Pacific War. And he really is. He's one of the, he's one of the greats and, and he, he should, should really be known by everyone. Well, thank you, Jim.